Hello, look at these people hanging out. I'm going to have Echo. Good way to start. Yeah. We haven't started. Hi, Otis. Hello, hello. I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen, seen you since in... uh, Fairfield. Yeah, right, right, right. I miss you. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So, how you doing, how Jim? You doing, Jim? Doing well. You got an echo going on there, Rex. Oh, oh. let me see let if me I, see can I can echo less. Me. Hello, Jim. Hey there, Otis. You oh, behaving I'm yourself? Right. Terry, Marcia. Okay, I need video. I need uh Burn that. Uh, is it still echoing? No, now it sounds good. Okay, can you hear? Talk again, Jim, please. Let me try. Hold on. Um, can you hear him? How's that? Good. Good to go, or no? Up a little bit. We're trying to get the sound studio. <clears throat> Wait till I get further into the meeting, uh, Rex. I'll have you turn me down. <laughs> turn the okay, volume down. Okay. I'll mute you. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> uh, hi, Carrie Rowan. Glad to see you. Hi, Rex. Yeah. Don't be bashful. You know, you can use your camera. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are going to record this, so uh, that's what it is. Oh. Okay, welcome everyone to the starting of business in California with Rex Crandell and Anna Santa Maria. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for logging in. Yeah, since we're not on Cal this time, we have uh, got independence uh, and no MCLE for uh, legal education, which is okay. Although we're going to be talking about a lot of different laws. So both Anna and I are uh, tax preparers uh, and we've noticed that a lot of small business owners, when they come in, there's just so much they don't know about what they're required to do, what they should have done, uh, what's coming up in the future. And, uh, you know, we also see it with the state planning that our office does. But we thought that it would be great for uh, there are just a lot of small businesses out there that need some kind of help. And that's what we thought this would uh, fill that need. Oh, let me, uh, inter do you want to introduce yourself or let me introduce you? You can introduce me. Okay. Go for it. Anna, Anna Santa Maria is uh, a tax specialist in Concord. She has a huge tax practice and big volume she's also a real estate licensee and uh speaks spanish like i do somewhat and uh, yeah she's uh you know really dynamic in in business and uh, i really admire that and uh i'm rex crandell i'm a cpa and an attorney uh -huh. and we do a lot of tax not in high volume but high complexity and uh, I'm also an attorney in our office. We do wills, trusts, and estates, estate administration of things, and deeds, like Mr. Wilroy does. So uh, let me, uh, we're just going to go through this. What the idea is, is we're going to give a, a wide range of subjects so that you'll get a good idea of a lot of things that perhaps you hadn't come across. Okay, so I'll start out here. How to launch a business. In California, there's several steps you should consider uh, in starting. And uh, first of all, find out what the heck you want to do, why you want to do it. And um, one of the key things about having a business is you need passion. You have to have passion for the subject that you're doing and the people that you're serving. And the passion is really important because when you hit obstacles, the uh, passion for what you're doing will help you get over them. Uh, prepare and plan. Look at financing. These are the head notes here. Choose an entity type. We'll go in, the, in detail. Uh, register your business. Get a business name. 
uh, choose location and zoning, uh, obtain specialty licenses for uh, California's got no ending list of uh, specialty licenses and understanding employee responsibilities so you don't get in trouble, tax information, and then ongoing uh, registration requirements for uh, businesses. So you're gonna start a business. Okay, what the heck do I do? It would be a good idea to start doing some research, finding out what other vendors are doing in the industry and what their what price the point is. And if you think you could make a profit at that price point or you have a certain um, plan that's a little bit unique for that market, um, but get a lot of information about what your competitors are doing. Price, volume, how many employees, locations, service lists, and uh, a wealth of information from the other companies out there. And if, if you want to call other companies, let's say you're doing research uh, and you're worried about calling people in your neighborhood, well, how about contacting companies in San Diego and asking them a bunch of questions because they won't think you're a competitor. Uh, write a business plan. This is uh, a good step to do uh, because it forces you to uh, think things ahead, way ahead that you might not uh, have thought of otherwise. Uh, so a business plan and uh, Nolo Press has a good book on writing business plans. There are others out there. And Another good thing to do is get professional advice, accounting, legal, uh, tax, uh, bookkeeping, because there's a lot of specialty areas and nobody's an expert in everything. So you start the planning process, you decide your business type and uh, what kind of uh, service you're going to do and how you're going to. Uh, operate your business. Uh, know the reason why you're going after this business. Is it a need that's not being met? Is it highly competitive? Um, one of the hardest things to do is have a business that's in a commodity business because in a commodity type business, everything's based on price. So um, it's better if it's specialty. Um, and when you get into business, there's no more nine to five. It might be 24 seven, you don't know. Um, and then look at the competitive uh, research factors. Uh, so in these are like headings in your business plan. You get a summary description, your market research, uh, how you're gonna staff uh, and get the work done. Uh, description of the product or services, how you plan to market, uh, fundraising if you need to, and then a, a financial uh, forecast. And I've seen, you know, a lot of these people will do a nice business plan and they'll go around to friends and family and see who wants to invest. Uh, but the main thing about having the business plan is that it helps you think things through that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And they did some studies and found out that people who start a business and have a business plan do much better success wise than the people who don't just kind of the seat of their pants. And part of the reason is everything's been thought out. And even the people who write a business plan start working and never look at their business plan again, they still do better because they've thought of all these things. So uh, it's good to have the business plan. And I say that and I believe it, <laughs> but I've owned several businesses and I've never done it. <laughs> I just start it and then find out and then change it and make sure it, what doesn't work. I got a different philosophy that I got from Stanford. It's called ready, fire, aim. So <laughs> you, you just start out and it doesn't work. So you got to aim a better shot next time. All right. <laughs> Truth be told. 
Mm-hmm. But still uh, working on it, right? Still yeah. working on the business plan. <laughs> right. Uh, secure financing. If you think you need financing, um, there's all different sizes. I mean, there's huge businesses start out. They got investors, things of that nature. If you think you need all of that, these are some of the ideas. Uh, different contact locations, small business development center, uh, financial development corporation, and if it's huge, industrial development bonds. But it just, um, you wouldn't even consider this unless it was big time. Like you're going to open up a cement uh, factory mine and, and something that's going to take, you know, a whole big amount of capital. So in the area of securing financing, there's an angel investor subject that somebody who wants to invest in businesses. And usually in a startup phase, uh, we've given you a list of some of the contact points if you want to look for investors. And uh, you'd have to have a business plan and follow their criteria to be considered. But it does happen. I mean, I hear it a lot in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, So if that's of interest to you, look into it. Uh, The Hells Angels, uh, we suggest you don't contact them for uh, business financing because it it probably wouldn't work out well. Uh, Venture capitalists, these are uh, oftentimes groups of investors and um, one of them that I'm, I'm aware of is John Dewar, who's written an excellent book called uh, Measure What Matters. It's excellent. He was part of the reason behind Google taking off to the stratosphere. But there are, um, you know, books around lists of uh, venture capitalists, and uh, they want a piece of the action. I mean, they may want 40% of what you end up with so uh, but they do put up the capital uh, i don't know that tv show shark tank what if they're angels or venture capitalists um but that's what you're talking about getting someone else's money and they're gonna run your percentage ownership down there's six types of business in- entities in california there's uh at least six. Uh, sole proprietorship, which I advocate because it's lower cost. And then there's limited liability companies that uh, are supposed to shield you from liabilities uh, of the debts of the business. And uh, you can either have one owner or multiple owners. There's a corporation, which everybody knows about. And uh, there's two basic flavors or three of uh, corporations. There's a C Corp, S Corp, and then a nonprofit, which we'll talk about. General partnerships, not too popular because you have uh, liability. Each person um, has personal liability. There was a huge accounting firm a few years back that went bankrupt after Enron. And all the partners went bankrupt along with it. So uh, if you had an LLC, that might be a better result. Uh, LLPs are just unique for lawyers, architects, and accountants. And then limited partnerships. Um, You have one general partner who's liable for all the debts of the entity, and then all the limited partners who are like passive investors and uh, they're not exposed to liability. Okay, so this is our first type of corporation called a C-Corp. That's my term. Um, Some people just call it a corporation. I don't because my next question is it a C or an S-Corp. The way that the C-Corp works is all the money comes in then all your expenses, and then you have your bucket of net income, and that net income gets taxed by the federal and state government on that net income. And then after you've paid your tax, 
on the corporate level, you say, oh yeah, I want a dividend. Can you give me a dividend? Sure, give a dividend and then the shareholder gets taxed again. So they call it double taxation, uh, which is like, uh, I don't know, double epectomy or something. I don't know. But it, we get around that all the time with our clients. It just so happens that their salary uses up all of the net income every year. So there's no net income to pay tax on. And it just happens every year like that. So the corp doesn't get taxed. Now, the other one, this one's a bit more popular, the S Corp, uh, subchapter S, it came out in 1959. And it has some unique characteristics in that the same thing about the income coming in, the expenses going out, and the net income in your uh, income bucket, but it's like there's uh, a leaky faucet. All the income that is in the S Corp, if you have three owners, that income just falls out onto their tax return. It's not taxed at the entity level other than the $800 to California franchise. And uh, all of the shareholders um, end up getting a distributive share of the net income on a form called uh, K-1. So it's a way to allocate the income. And then they pick that income up on their personal return. Uh, the S-Corp requirement, you have, each person has to have a reasonable salary and then the nice thing about it is the net income above the reasonable salary, uh, ordinarily you would have to pay self-employment tax, a 15.3% of your net uh, on your personal return. But in the S Corp, and if you have a reasonable salary, there, there is no self-employment tax on the income on the K-1 and we call that beating the FICA game. So it saves them 15%, 15.3. Now, LLCs. This is a hybrid structure that came in in the late 90s. And it's probably the most popular business entity. Um, it's not all advantages, though. Um, the LLC gets all the income in and then expenses, and then like the S Corp, uh, all the income falls out to the owners based on their ownership percentage on a K-1. Uh, one of the disadvantages of the corporations are the formalities of uh, you know, bylaws and minutes of the meet, board meetings and things, and the uh, LLC does not have that. Uh, when the net income is passed out to the members, they're not called shareholders, that income gets taxed for income tax. And if they're working in the business, then they also pay the self-employment tax, which is your own social security. So it, it's not bad. Uh, you'll end up using it in the future. Uh, and if a member owner does not work in the company, then uh, they don't have that self-employment tax. They're a passive investor. So in the LLCs, it's kind of unique. Uh, if there's one member, one owner, and the IRS calls it a disregarded entity, you don't have to file a separate tax return. So we just put the income on the Schedule C for small business and no entity return, and we pay the self-employment tax. Um, unfortunately, California wants you to fill out a, a form every year for the S Corp, a correction for the LLC, and uh, you might have some additional tax due if you have high, in high income on sales, but it's uh, disregarded for federal tax purposes one owner. Now, if you have a bunch of owners on a LLC, then what happens is 
the income gets distributed out and you have to file a federal tax return and a state. So it shows the income expenses and then how much is going out to the owners on a K-1. And so this one will go on a 1040 and in the tax uh, forms have a, a schedule E, uh, page two, where you show the income and you do pay self-employment tax. Um, but I'd say the LLC is the most popular entity, but you don't need one, uh, as we'll cover later. So other types of entities, general partnerships, everybody gets together. Where did you go here? Disappeared. <laughs> uh, I'll find out where I'm at soon. Uh, and all, all the members are uh, owners, shareholders, uh, partners are liable for all the debts of the entity. There are limited partnerships where you have one uh, general partner who's liable for all the debts of the entity. And then the limited partners uh, are not. They're like investors. And uh, there are some large ones. They used to use them in real estate tax shelters all the time. Uh, I don't see too many of them anymore. Then the limited part, uh, limited liability partnerships, as we mentioned, accountants, architects, and attorneys. Um, the other thing I, I put this as a business entity, and it's kind of like, what? What are you talking about? Um, an irrevocable trust is a separate legal entity, and I'm unaware of any law that says you cannot run a business under an a irrevocable trust. In fact, a long time ago, some of the first corporations uh, were trust. It was under a law of Massachusetts business trust. Uh, but it's not that common. And yeah, it might be used in estate planning, but not that common. So now, what kind of entity do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, OK. So we start evaluating the entities. And that determines what kind of paperwork you need to file. And it impacts your ability to get financing. Um, most of uh, the companies that get financing have to be C Corps because the equity investors don't want a K-1 messing up their tax returns. And the C Corp pays tax so they don't get any income flowing back. Um, many, most of the entities require registration with the state of California, including the corporation, LLC, LPs, and uh, limited liability partnerships. Uh, not required, but you can register general partners with the Secretary of State. And the entity not requiring registration with the state government in Sacramento or sole proprietorships. And uh, I'm an advocate of sole proprietorships. You have to file a fictitious name statement usually. And there's a whole lot less red tape. And uh, a lot of people put the sole proprietor down, uh, but if you don't have a business already and you're just starting out, I really suggest that you prove your business concept before plunking down, you know, 3000 or more dollars. And then you find out nobody in the hell wants to buy your product or service and you're out all that money. You can prove it by filing a fictitious name or, or just using your own name. You don't have to file anything. And uh, I really think for a lot of small businesses that have very little capital that it's better. And people will tell you, well, you might, you know, you got to, with the liability protection, you need to protect your assets, okay? And you need an entity for that reason. Well, when you're just starting out and you're hardly selling anything, what's the liability risk, you know? Hardly anything. Uh, I've seen people have entities and they talk about liability protection and the kind of product or service they do, they would never, ever get sued. 
So uh, test your business idea first and uh, consider the uh, uh, sole proprietorship as a good option. Uh, what happens, I think, a lot of times, unfortunately, is like on the legal Zoom ad, it says, oh, form your LLC. Let's make it official. Like you're, uh, you're a second class citizen if you don't have an entity that's an LLC. Well, you just wasted a bunch of money because you didn't evaluate the choices uh, for the optimal solution. So you set up the entities with the Secretary of State and if you want a fictitious business name, sole proprietor, you can do that in the county. Um, you might want to look around to see if the name is um, taken already. Uh, the state has uh, this link to check business names, but don't think that's the only source of business names. The counties also have uh, certain names. State of California, if you get a name like that's so much like another company, they won't issue you your um, registration papers. Um, and you might consider securing your web domain even before you file a name statement so that, you know, you might be yourbusinessname.com slash LLC. And then um, your name and your website tell both sides of it uh consider social media um as another uh option for uh marketing um i have a problem with this one and i'll tell you what it is the secretary of state comes out with this chart say oh you want to form an llc oh 20 bucks oh yeah you want to form a corporation oh yeah 20 bucks that's baloney. And in fact, it my opinion, it's sucker bait. It's what they're doing is they're getting you their your toe in the door. And then right after that 90 days, you've got to file a statement of information identifying your agent for service of legal process. Most people don't. Then they get a $250 fine. So we've added up costs already. And there's also the annual cost of preparation, tax preparation for your entity. It might be, you know, 500 to 1500. So, um, and then the California, you know, in the long run, they're getting uh, 800 bucks a year just to be on their mailing list. And um, sometimes it's not worth being on their mailing list. Mm -hmm. So when you form an entity, you have to have a person named a registered agent for service of process. Uh, and what that does is if uh, there's legal papers, they're served on this person, you can do it yourself. Uh, but a uh, registered agent, we do it uh, for companies and, and oftentimes when we're forming entities. Uh, and the legal papers have to be served on us, us and then find the client. And uh, make sure they know that those legal papers have been filed. Uh, it's just a formality, and uh, but it, it's important when it's needed. Now, register your business name. In this case, it's uh, you're going to need a federal ID number with any new entity, and. Even a sole proprietorship, I recommend getting an employer ID number. Uh, you get them from IRS. Uh, we do them in our office online for clients while they wait. Um, there is an SS4 form you can fill out. Um, so it's just needed. And, and it's important, like you were getting 1099s. I think it's much better giving them uh, the companies getting your 1099 in a, a federal ID number instead of your social security number. Okay, ITIN, uh, if you're not eligible for a social security number, uh, there's a process that we do is file an, a W-7 
And uh, so you're going to form an entity and run a business in the United States, but you don't have any uh, uh, immigration papers or anything like that. Well, you can fill out this uh, I-10 application. You end up sending your passport to the IRS, wait a few weeks, and then you get an identification number that you can use to report your income to the federal government. And uh, it has some limitations, but you should do this if you need it uh, before you file an entity. Uh, it does not give you authorization to work in the US, nor provide social security benefits. And when you do your tax returns, uh, you cannot claim the uh, earned income tax credit. Uh, <laughs> this is a joke for, uh, I see legal Zoom people. They they go to legal Zoom. They form an entity and they get a piece of paper. Then they get put out in the cold. They don't know what the hell they're doing, but they've got an entity and they think that's all that they need. Uh, I disagree. Um, when we form entities for clients, we include the corporation kit binder to put all your records. Uh, we act as the registered agent for service of process. We issue stock certificates or membership certificates for LLCs. Uh, we talk to our clients whether they'd benefit from an S Corp because every company when it's filed as a corp is a C Corp, which will tax on its net income, unless you elect with IRS to be taxed differently as a, an S Corp. Uh, we include the corporate bylaws or the LLC operating agreement, get the employer ID number. Uh, we include the records for board of directors meeting and uh, explain the business responsibilities for uh, business owners. Once in a while, I run across somebody, they get these advertisements from out of state. Oh, form a company in Delaware and Nevada, and you'll be invisible in California. Well, guess what? That's a pipe dream, and you won't be invisible. And what will really happen is you won't have access to California courts. Uh, you'll end up getting fined by the state. And uh, if you comply with what you're supposed to do, you're going to have to register with the Secretary of State anyway. And then you have the added cost of your um, out-of-state entity. So skip that little game. Uh, fictitious business name. Did you want to cover this one, Anna? Yeah, let's see. Okay, so how to apply and where to apply. So fictitious business names are filed with the county clerk or the recorder office. Um, if you're using your own name for your business, you do not need to apply for a fictitious name. A lot of people don't know that. So, um, so just make sure to make a note of that. Uh, before heading to the county clerk office, one thing I do recommend, it's also recommended here, is to refer to the county's county website, website to see what kind of paperwork you need, what kind of fees they're going to charge you, and mostly more important to find out if that business name is available, okay? Uh, because you don't want to catch yourself at the you know clerk office and that name's not available and you're trying to search for a name. So it's always good to do your research on the business name. And on that business name, you, frequently the counties will let you go onto their website and search from home on the internet. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the counties will have a computer at the recorder clerk office. You can search the names there. And then, you know, go prepare and have at least like two other names just in case, right? Um, also, by doing this, this allows other businesses and other startup businesses know that that name is taken. Okay, so that's a great way to protect your name. Um, let's see what else here. And before you go down there, you want to know what kind of entity you're going to hold on your business um, and also have an address for your business. So those are important things. You want to make sure that the name is available. You want to make sure you have a business address for the business. And you want to make sure you know what kind of entity you're going to hold before heading down to the clerk office. 
The uh, assumption is when you go for a fictitious name that you're going to be a sole proprietorship. Uh, but that's not that's all not the case. case. I'll get companies, they want a business name and they form an entity and they can't have the name they want. I say, no problem. Call it XYZ. We didn't do it, Inc. And we'll go to the county recorder's office and make the business the exact name you want. Yes. And then the application process, um, you know, name, address, business location. Um, it's also asking how you're going to hold your entity of your business. Um, you don't need to have your EIN number when you're applying for a fictitious name. So you don't have to worry about that quite yet. But if you have it ready, that's great. Um, but it's not asking for that information. And then they'll give you steps of what to do after you fill this out. They'll give you steps of what to do and where to advertise your business so that you can let the public know that you are in business and that name is taken by you. Yeah, and the advertising part that she's saying is not to drum up business. It's a legal requirement. You have to give the public notice that, you know, like say Rex Crandell is doing business as, I don't know, I didn't do it. And uh, you have to advertise it and then get a certificate of uh, publication. And if you, you sometimes are asked for that, the bank sometimes asks for it. Uh, and if you take somebody's small claims or something, they ask for it. So it's just uh, one of the requirements. And there's also a time limit on that, when you have to have that done. So I believe it's 60 days. If you don't have that done before the 60 days, you have to start the application process all over again and pay another fee. Mm. So I do recommend getting that done right away after applying for the fictitious business name. And then we have an example, of, and then there's instructions depending on your um, county and recorder office of what to do. Okay, so register your, your business um, through a like a FedEx office or postal annex um, versus a post office. What are the benefits? Um, so, so what we're talking about here is what are you going to show the world as your business address? Mm -hmm. and especially if you're running a home-based business, you don't have a front store and you want to protect your, you know, personal address or personal right, privacy. You. Um, I do recommend, you know, using like a FedEx station, UPS, or a uh, postal annex. Uh, the nice thing about using these businesses is that they actually have an actual address. So, for example, it would be like 1839 Ignatia Valley Road. It's not going to be a P.O. box. So it's also safe. You can also receive FedEx packages, UPS packages, which is great. Um, and it looks, you know, professional as well. Like it's an address, right? It's not like it's just a P.O. box address. So do recommend doing that especially for home-based businesses um, or online businesses. So once you're ready to open your bank account, uh, things that are recommended to have and to have ready before you go to your local bank is um, having your either your fictitious name paperwork EIN number, if you're going to use an EIN number for your business, um, your city license, if you applied also for a city license. So you bring all that paperwork together and then you go and you open your business bank account. Why is this so important to open a business, business bank account? For many reasons, to keep track of your income, to keep track of your expenses, to separate your personal assets with your business um, income and expenses and all that good stuff. And it also makes it easier for tax purposes. Um, and then also when you're applying for either, you know, a credit card loan or a business line of credit, you know, it looks more organized. Um, so definitely use a business bank account for your business. It's a great way of tracking. And then if you're using like a QuickBooks, um, you know, software, you can also link it, your business account to the QuickBooks, 
which is really nice and it will help you separate your your transactions and all that good stuff you want location yeah so choosing the location and checking your zoning regulations is so important before signing a lease uh, i would contact the you know your city the, your county to find out you know what requirements um, if there's special business licenses you have to have um, if you're in the right zoning before signing a lease, or if there's any permit that you also have to apply for. So it's super important to check with your city and your county before signing a lease um, for your business. Um, there is additional websites that you can actually um, visit, which we have it here, which is the um, Governor Office of Business Economic Development. That will have further information about you know what different licenses you have to have what type of zonings and all that good stuff for your business and help you with uh selecting a, a, a location and yeah so obtaining a, a special license or permits um once you form your entity you have registered your your business with the california state uh, you must have um, or you must know what kind of, you know, licenses and permits you need to have. Another great website to visit is the um, calgold.gov. Actually, sorry, calgold.ca.gov. And it's on your screen as well. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, find out what kind of business permits and license and what kind of registrations you're required um, to have in order for you to operate your business. And for nonprofit organizations, um, it's recommended to visit the Attorney General Registration of Charitable Trust. And you have to do that within 30 days of the receipt of an asset, okay? Um, so it's recommended to check out, out the General Registration of Charitable Trust website in order for you to know what the process and what type of permits you need to have and, and applications. Some of the other specialty licenses um, would include like, say if you want had a nail salon or a contractor license, you uh, various type real estate broker, you would want to uh, get your entity set up first so you could register with the, um, the specialty licenses. So now obtaining um, specialty licenses and permits. So if you have a home-based business where you're using your name, you can obtain a city license and you don't have to apply for a facetious name. If you're gonna apply for a facetious name, uh, you do that first, then you apply for your city business license. Uh, also, if you have an ITIN number, you can apply for a business um, license as well. People don't know that. They can actually do that. And uh, one thing on the city business license, if you end up showing your residential address on a city business license, uh, they're going to give you a lecture on putting signage. You know, if you put a billboard on your front lawn, I guarantee it's not going to be there very long. Yeah, so you got to be careful with cars coming in and out of your home. Um, they can actually shut down your business if your neighbors are complaining about that. Um, so you do have to be careful with home-based businesses. Now, if you're applying for a seller's permit, okay, that's a whole different department. You would contact the California Department of Tax and Fee Admin, okay? This is only if you are reselling product. That's that, that's when you apply for this um, license. And also there is an annual tax return that you have to file every year that people are not aware of. Um, and then you would do that with um, CDTFA. And here's the information. And let's see what else. And it's pretty easy to do, actually, to file a tax return. You just do it online. Uh, they're really good on sending you a letter. And in that letter, there's going to be like a special number that you're going to use once you log online. And it takes a few minutes to do. 
So these are for, for folks that have, you know, home-based businesses like Amazon, um, French stores, or if they're reselling products, you know, this is when you apply for, for yeah, the seller any, permit. Any business that sells tangible personal property. So it doesn't matter if you manufacture it yourself or um, you're reselling anything that's a product. And sometimes they've gotten so picky that, uh, like for software, that's intangible. And then when somebody used to give them a CD ROM, oh, now it's all a product. And they wanted sales tax on that. Yes. So when you're collecting sales taxes, that's when you start filing those returns. Um, employer's responsibility. So uh, what is an employer's responsibility? What do you have to be aware of? Well, you have to register your business. You have to obtain an EIN number, a state ID number, um, especially if you're thinking of running payroll. You definitely need to obtain these, um, these uh, federal numbers in order for you to run your payroll. Uh, the employer's obligation is to collect payroll taxes, to pay the federal and state taxes, to pay the state taxes, um, also to have workers comp for your business. Um, so that's all the employer's uh, obligation. And let's see what else. For more information, we also have three different websites here that you can visit that will give you more information about what you need to obtain as an employer. Um, also, you need to talk about and have certain um, workplace safety and health regulations, um, and also have equal employment opportunity uh, notices somewhere in the business posted. Um, and all these things, you can refer back to these different websites here that can help you with that. Now, payroll taxes are really important. Um, if you miss reporting those every quarter, you can get penalized big time. Um, what I recommend my business customers to do is just, especially because they're, they're so busy trying to run a business. I'm like, listen, just hire a company to help you with this. Don't yeah, do it yourself. Service. Yeah. Gusto, paychecks, ADP. Have these folks that specialize only in payroll services take care of it. Um, and it will save you the headaches. So a lot of my customers do do that. And then the nice thing is that if they are using like a QuickBooks services, they can actually link their payroll services to it. So it makes things a lot more easier. And the employees like having the direct deposit of their checks into mm -hmm. their bank account. Exactly. How do you cover this one? Okay, so I get new business owners in, and I've laughed over the years because they all say the same thing. They hear about payroll and they go, Oh, well, we decided we're not going to have employees. We're going to have everybody as an independent contractor. Eh, wrong answer. Uh, everybody says that, and uh, they think they can get away with it for a while, but. Um, it can come back to haunt you and it's very expensive. Uh, I had one company that did that. They were a carpet company and they got nailed for three years of payroll tax, both employer and employee. And they didn't learn their lessons. The EDD came back three years later and nailed them again. Uh, and the state is very cynical about what an independent contractor is. Do they have their own business license? Are they have their own location? Do they work with a lot of other comp people? Um, don't play that game. You're basically building up uh, a liability. And sometimes that when I've seen them, they call them reclassification. They go from being independent and then the government uses the 1099s against you that you're supposed to file. And they come in and say, everybody's an employee. So it's easier to comply than uh, try to skirt the responsibility. So understanding the tax requirements as a business owner is very important. There's several agencies that you have to deal with. You have the IRS, 
you have the state of California. If you hold an LLC or, or S corporation or C corporation, you also have to pay your secretary of state taxes. And that's a whole different department. Also, if you have a nonprofit and you have to file certain forms, that's a whole different department too. So it's very important to know your agencies as a business owner. Um, so you know who you're talking to and who you're paying and what you're paying for. Now, um, this is one thing I've, I've, I've been, you know, really tough with my small business owners the last couple of years is to have a really good bookkeeping system. It is so important. I'm like, when you book a, an appointment with me, I don't want to sit there and, and add all your receipts. I don't want boxes of receipts in my office. I want you to come prepared. Um, so it's so important as a small business owner uh, to have a bookkeeping system or to hire an in-house bookkeeping a bookkeeper, depending on the size of your business. Uh, but, you know, for payroll services, you can hire, once again, paychecks, ADP, uh, Gusto, you can use QuickBooks online, also QuickBooks, the desktop is great, um, and you can link all your bank account um, information, your credit card information, it will help you separate it. Uh, but it's so important to have a good bookkeeping system for tax purposes so you're not missing any deductions. You know exactly where your money's going, how much you're, you're spending on advertisement or equipment. Um, it's so important to know where your business is at. And also, if you have to pay estimated taxes, the QuickBooks system will help you estimate and remind you, hey, you know, your, your estimated taxes are coming up. Don't forget to pay a certain dollar amount. Um, you know, your payroll taxes as well. Um, so having a, a, a bookkeeping system also will help you, you know, if you ever have to go through an audit, you know, you have all your stuff there. Um, so it's so important to have a bookkeeping system that will help you know what your profit and income expenses are. And if you're applying for any type of loans for your business, it will also generate certain forms that you're going to need for those loans, which is so important to have. Another thing on bookkeeping systems is uh, keep it up. I mean, you got to post it every so often. Don't let a bank statement month go by without posting all your records. I see these people come in and they've got a great bookkeeping system and nothing's posted in it. And then they whine, moan and complain because they've got a mountain of paper to go through at the end of the year. If you do it a little chunk at a time, keep your books up to date. You'll, you'll be able to use the benefits of the feedback from that bookkeeping system and it won't be a burden for you. Especially during tax time, right? <laughs> okay, let's see here. So additional resources um, and agencies that we have to deal with when we're self-employed is the Franchise Tax Board. Um, also the California Employment Development, which is EDD, which they're in charge of like unemployment insurance, insurance training, uh, state disability, SDI, um, also personal income taxes. They will, they will take care of all of that. And that's the edd.ca.gov website. Now for the California Department of State and Fee Administration, um, this agency will take care of, you know, your sales taxes, right? So this is when you're reselling products. That's when you'll, you'll file with them. And that's the agency that you'll be talking to for that. And then we have also the um, California State of Board Legalization, which um, administrates uh, personal taxes, alcohol beverages, taxes, uh, taxes on insurers. They will take care of all that. And then we have also the California Tax Service um, Center, which is a partnership of tax agencies that um, have joined and have helped tax preparers or tax payers for resources and education programs and to find out also if your tax preparer is licensed. Um, so that, that's where you referenced for that. 
year. So understanding your bookkeeping system. So going back to the QuickBooks, um, which is really cool that it will generate income tax statements for you. Um, an income tax statement is also known as a profit and, and losses statement, which shows all the earnings, the financial statements, a summary of the company's revenue and expenses and net income, um, which is really important, especially if you're applying for certain loans. They will definitely ask for that. Then we have the balance sheet here. Um, the balance sheet is a financial statement that shows, you know, the assets and the liabilities and the shareholders information. Um, and that will also be asked if you're applying for any type of loan. Now, the statement of cash flow. This is like a summary of cash in, cash out. How much cash is there in your business? Uh, it will also show activity of your sales and expenses and investments, uh, but it's mostly used for cash flow management. So the, here's an example of your profit and losses uh, statement. Uh, on the top, you would have your name of your business, your address of your business, and also the date. You know, some, some of these profit and losses statements are generated every three months, six months, or annually. Um, so it will show on the top of that. And it will show your income, the cost of goods sold, the total cost of uh, cost goods sold, your gross profits, your expenses, and your net profits before taxes. Um, so this would, would be used for applying for any home loans. And it's great to look at this. Then you'll know exactly what your business is generating and where you're spending your, your money in your business as well. This would include only deductible business expenses. Mm -hmm. So if you took out money for your own personal use, that's not going to be subtracted from this to come up with your net income. Mm -hmm. And here's an example of your balance sheet. It will show your current assets, uh, accounts receivable, your inventory. Uh, it will also show if you have any equipment, de you know, depreciation, um, what kind of assets your business is holding, the liabilities, accounts payable, uh, taxes are payable as well. Um, also your shareholders equity. So this is kind of like an overall of your business assets and your liabilities. And the balance sheet, we have these different uh, purposes for these reports. The balance sheet is at a point in time, December 31, 2022. So you take a snapshot on that date, your cal, uh, cash was this amount, your inventory was this amount. And then the first report we looked at was an income statement or profit and loss. And that is over a period of time from the beginning to the next accounting period. So they have uh, a different perspective. So then we have our statement of cash flow. It's going to show your customer's payments, the material, your payroll costs, and other payments. And it's also going to show equipment purchase for your business, any loans that your business has. And it will show the ending balance of the cash flow. Uh, one of the things I look at the cash flow statement for is I get these clients in and they say, what? You said I made $75,000. How come I don't have any money? Well, you need to look at your statement of cash flows because you might have taken it out as a distribution. You might have bought equipment, things like that. So um, this statement of cash flow ignores all tax treatment and it's just cash in, cash out, what's left. Now, developing internet presence is so important, especially nowadays, right? Um, so you definitely want to register a domain name of your company's website, which you can do with domain.com, Bluehost, GoDaddy.com, Namecheap.com. So these are websites that you can actually register your domain. Designing a website, creating a profile on social media like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Meta, 
Um, there's many more now. Uh, registering your business through Google Business is very important. And also creating a review uh, account with like Yelp, Google Review, AngelList, and there's many more that would help you generate business. So these are ways that you can, you know, put yourself out there and they're not that expensive. You know, the most expensive thing here on the list, I would say, would be the website. But other than that, you know, um, social media services is free. Registering your business through Google is free unless you want to do advertisement. Um, and then creating a review site with um, Yelp and Google reviews is also free. The uh, Google business profile is a service. You, I think you need to have a, a one Gmail uh, email account. But what it is, is when you're searching for a business and you notice it'll go over on the side and show a picture of a business and give you uh, information about the company. That's not by accident. That is what's called the Google profile. And uh, you want to pay some attention and, and make sure you fill it out uh, so it gives you a good perspective. Okay, so ongoing registration requirements. Uh, you just don't form an entity and forget about it. Uh, you've got annual tax returns. You have uh, for corporations, you have an annual statement of information and appointment of an agent for service of process. For LLCs, every two years, based on the month you calendar month you formed the entity, you have to file the statement of information. And it's kind of innocuous. I mean, $25 if you file it on time and it's $250 fine if you don't. And um, if you don't file it long enough, they'll suspend your corporation or LLC. And technically you're not allowed to use it anymore. Um, so you have responsibilities that keep going with the, uh, the entities. You want me to take this one? I'll, I'll let you. Yeah. Ahead. Okay. So uh, my view is honesty and integrity is extremely important in business and in life in general. So I suggest being truthful and honest in all your transactions and reporting. Uh, report all your income, even if it's cash, deduct only proper business expenses, and one of the benefits, it'll let you sleep better at night, not worrying about, you know, problems. Uh, and it's my view that honesty and integrity holds our entire society together. Uh, when somebody gets into an ethical question, I see it come out. It goes like this. Well, who's going to know about it anyway? How are they going to find out? Eh, wrong question. All the people that get in trouble think they weren't going to get in trouble. Don't even ask that. What you should ask is, what's the result if everybody that's affected by this transaction knows everything about it? That's the proper question. And in terms of consumers, always make your consumer happy, regardless of the profit and loss on that one transaction, because the uh, the government tends to feel that businesses are always wrong, uh, even when it's uh, maybe not the case. Uh, okay, you want to take that one? Or? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I could take that one. So how much does it cost uh, to, to get a seller's permit? So there's no fee to apply for a seller's permit. Uh, when you collect this, the sales taxes and you report that either annually on the um, on their website, that's when you pay the seller's taxes fees. But there's no, there's no fee to apply for a seller's permit, it's, it's free. And remember, you only need it when you are selling inventory, okay? Now, when you apply for the application, they will ask you, well, how much sales taxes do you tend to collect? Um, 
let them know that you don't know. Because if you let them know that, oh, I might be collecting $10,000 in sales taxes, they're going to ask for a deposit. And that could be a large amount. So I recommend just, you know, saying, I don't know what the sales taxes that I'm going to be collecting. Um, very little. I don't think we're going to get very much at all. So uh, don't charge me a big deposit. I don't want to pay it. Exactly. And once you, you file your annually uh, report to them, that's when you, you pay uh, some fees that they do charge when, yeah, you, yeah. when you file your return. Okay. So you want me to take this one? Yeah, I'll let you take that sure. one. Sure. Uh, okay. So an LLC every year, we've talked about, and the corps, uh, corporations have to pay $800 annual minimum franchise tax fee. And a lot of people get mistaken uh, information about the LLCs in that that's all you're ever going to have to pay is the $800. And that's not true. Uh, California is a very unusual tax on gross income. When your income, gross sales go over 250000 they start adding on more tax in addition to the $800. So it, it increases and sometimes quite substantially. Uh, we've seen cases where there was an LLC with high sales and, and low profit. And uh, what we ended up, and they had to pay a lot every year because of this. And we converted them to an S corporation. And now they pay only 800 a year. So you need to kind of get an idea of what your uh, sales projections uh, might be. Just adding on to that really quickly, it doesn't matter what the, the gross um, or what the net, I'm sorry, is going to be. It's the gross amount. So you can make, you know, you can gross a million dollars in your company, but if you only netted a hundred thousand, then you're going to pay, you know, what is it? Uh, six sixty-eight hundred dollar fee. Yeah, and even if you had a loss, you'd yeah. still pay sixty-eight hundred, exactly. which uh, it's the most unusual tax on gross income. But uh, California is creative that way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, business license in California, you can count on it. Uh, I always kid around like, uh, you need a business. Yeah, call one eight hundred. Send us your money. Uh, they're not opposed to doing that. You want this one? I'll let you have that one. Okay. You can be better at that one. Than yeah, me. fine. <laughs> um, does uh, federal and state government help business thrive? Well, I've seen the state of California. Uh, they seem to focus on the consumer. They have a department of consumer affairs. They don't have a department of helping business. Uh, they're not really business friendly and uh, they keep coming out with new laws and regulations that are anti-business uh, frequently. And uh, that's why you need to really default to uh, making sure that the consumers are all taken care of. Um, as I watch legislation over many years, it just seems like uh, they keep taking away more, pushing more expenses out on business without even a, any concern at all uh, how it impacts the business uh, because they're not focusing on the business. So here's some um, different websites that you can refer to. Um, California Secretary of State, that's where you go and you register your business. Um, especially if you're going to apply for a corporation, LLC, um, the uh, Cal Gold, it's a great tool to figure out which license and permits you need for your business. Um, SBA loans, uh, they're great for, you know, small or large business loans. Um, then we have the California Small Business Association. Um, then we have the Small uh, Business Minority in California, um, which are great advocates for small businesses. Then we have SCOR, uh, which is like a service corp of retirement executives. Um, 
that they are also supporting, you know, large businesses. Um, and then we have the California Small Business Development Center, which is another resource for small business owners um, for guidance and resources. And when you, uh, the Small Business Administration um, does, that's our focus is helping small business uh, they have a lot of resources and, and one of the divisions of the small, uh, small business associate administration is score service quarter retired executives. So they get successful executives that have been a lot of corporate experience. And when they retire, they want to volunteer and help uh, businesses in their development. And they provide mentoring service, problem solving, uh, services. Uh, there's one in San Francisco uh, also. So we've covered quite a few things now and you have a good overview. Uh, if we went too fast, uh, you can go back through the material. We're going to make the, the material available um, on YouTube. And uh, so you've gotten a, a, a broad spectrum of uh, business ideas. So we're closing, we call it the beginning because it's just the start of your business. And now you've heard about it. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and that grin and guy there just cracks me up. I think that's so corny. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that, that'll be the conclusion uh, of today's program. Uh, Sometimes we'll have a chat, but we never opened it up. So uh, actually, if somebody has a question, uh, we'll be happy to, to answer it. Well, then don't ask. <laughs> Forever hold your silence. That's okay, too. We must have answered everything or you're bored out of your wits. What the, we'll... Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, make it available and, and catch you next time and uh thank you for your time yeah we hope you got a benefit out of the program we had fun presenting it so bye All now right. have a good night bye bye have a great night very nice meeting you guys hold us out <sighs>